insufficient. In 2015, a new set of goals was defined in the SDGs. In a famous document called Transforming Our World, the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. And as part of it, all the heads of state and government, meeting in 2015, adopted this resolution on transforming the world in which they agreed to promote physical and mental health and well-being and to extend life expectancy for all, we must achieve universal health coverage. So you can see we've gone from uh, primary health care to uh, universal health coverage to a sustainable development goals. A set of 17 sustainable development goals and the World Health Organization has stated that since universal health coverage was inserted into the sustainable development goals, WHO said that the inclusion of universal health coverage in the SDGs represents an opportunity to promote a comprehensive and coherent approach to health, focusing on health systems and strengthening. That's what I'm building up to, health systems. The awareness in the World Health Organization, building on the traditions that I mentioned of Alma-Ata and universal health coverage, to the sustainable development goals, what we want to achieve by 2030, focusing on health systems strengthening. And that's my subject for today, health systems strengthening. Countries that progress towards UHC will make progress toward the other health-related targets and toward other goals. Universal health coverage has therefore become a major goal for health reform in many countries and a priority objective of the World Health Organization. So you understand this flow from Constitution of the World Health Organization, Almada Declaration, uh, universal health coverage, sustainable development goals. And uh, a document that was, I hope, was made available to you. I don't know if any of you have had an opportunity to read it. There many, many publications on this. <clears throat> a uh, former colleague of mine, David Bloom, with some colleagues, uh, published this uh, article in, uh, in Science Magazine uh, called The Promise and Peril of Universal Health Coverage. And in that, they examine, again, if you want to read this article, it is available to you. Um, it does address the issue from an advanced understanding of public health issues, but that's useful for you to become familiar with the literature because this is not uh, a, a journal piece. This is a scientific review piece. This is peer-reviewed scientific literature. Ultimately, the path to universal health coverage and interventions prioritizing this process will be unique to each country pursuing universal coverage. So the point there is, yes, we all commit to universal health coverage, but there's not one model. You can't do it by saying, we will dictate from Geneva how you shall structure your health system. Each country has its own models. But the central motivation is the belief that access to health care with the goals of extending longevity and minimizing disability and diminishing suffering is a fundamental human right that advances equality and safeguards human dignity. So these are some fundamental conclusions of a very detailed analysis of what universal health care will mean. Universal health coverage, universal health care here not being distinguished. Some people prefer one term, some the other, but basically you understand what it is. It's utilizing, uh, making health for all a reality uh, under SDG 3.8. Now speaking of SDG 3.8, um, <clears throat> that is one of the 17 well, there's 17 uh, goals. The third one is health, and sub-article eight of that is universal health coverage. I'm not gonna bore you with all the details of all the other targets of uh, the sustainable development goals. The one of concern to us today in understanding health systems and what they mean for realizing 
complete physical, mental, and social well-being is target 3.8. That means SDG 3, health. Target 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Target 8 is achieve universal health coverage, including financial risk protection, access to quality essential health care services, and access to safe, effective, quality, and affordable essential medicines and vaccines for all. Now, you can unpack that. Look at every word in there, because this was carefully drafted by people who have put a lot of thought into this since the Alma-Ata Declaration. And you can see the component elements of a health system. You know that it involves financial risk protection, people who can't afford health because they're poor, access to quality health care services, safe, effective, and quality and affordable essential medicines and vaccines for all. And if you've ever worked with sustainable development goals, and I hope you will because there are many others that are relevant to social work and to uh, sociology, you'll find that there are 17 goals, each with sub-targets, and under each sub-target are indicators so that you can measure it. And since you're working in the social sciences, you know how important it is to have indicators. And so indicator 3.8.1 is on the coverage of essential health services. And this, and there's a, uh, an index of 1 to 100. And this is the, the document containing this is over 100 pages long, giving all the details but summarizing the performance of countries on achieving target 3.8 through the index here shows the countries that, are, um, that have a high level, 80 or above, 60 to 80 in blue, and yellow, 40 to 60, and in dark yellow, uh, 20 to 40. So you can see that the indicators that show achievement in universal health coverage show that this has been primarily successful in developing countries, excuse me, developed countries and develop and, and countries, many countries in between, including India, but African countries as being the ones with the lowest level, uh, lowest level of uh, the index of universal health coverage. So that's the situation in the world today. And you can see, not surprisingly, that um, the, uh, the US uh, doesn't rank with the best ones there. And we're going to find out why in a minute. <clears throat> so you saw that health systems was part of the SDG relating to health and achieving universal health coverage. To do so, you need functioning health systems that prioritize what the SDGs require and what universal health coverage requires. So in sociology, you certainly know what uh, systems refer to. And a health system involves, like any other system, organization, people, and actions. And the formal definition is that it's the people and actions and, and organizations whose primary intent is to promote, restore health. This includes uh, the determinants of health. So it's not just a hospital or a health center. It's other institutions in society that have an impact on the social determinants of health. We're going to talk more about that later. But um, I was mentioning the importance of unpacking the definition of, of this target because it contains in it several elements where you can say, yes, a functioning healthcare system must deal with the question of financial risk, must deal with quality and so on. Well, the World Health Organization has put a lot of thought into what really do we mean by the health system? And it has studied, I don't know if you can see this in the back, maybe this chair is blocking it. It involves these six elements. Leadership and governance, yes. You need a minister of health. You need legislation to say, this, these are the, the, uh, the objectives of our health system, and these are the people who are responsible for it. Leadership, 
this is who's in charge, this is the ministry, this is the sub-ministry, this is how it's structured, this is what the central government does, this is what state governments do, this is what local governments do. Leadership and governance. Service delivery. How does the health system ensure that the health needs of the population are met because even if you've got the facilities and you understand the need, is it delivered to the people who need it? So, you have a epidemic or a pandemic, you need vaccines, you have the vaccines, you have the decision to do them, that doesn't count unless you have service delivered. To do all that, it costs a lot of money. And I'm gonna focus on costs in a minute to show you the comparative expenditure on health of India and other countries. You know this already, because there's a lot of talk about it. We'll go into that in a minute. So obviously, health system financing is fundamental. The resources have to be there, which means you need the legislative authorities in deciding in a budget to say, no, we cannot stay with 1.6% of the national budget being for health. It has to go up at least to 2.5%. And I'm using those numbers because they apply to India. Um, health workforce. It's not just the leadership that is going to make it happen. You need qualified people in the field to do it. And you need social workers to be part of that health workforce. Medical products, vaccines, and technology. India is taking leadership in this area. We all know that that's an important part of it. But how do you get these medical products, vaccines, and technologies available to all? And the sixth is health information systems. How do you communicate? How do people know where to get access to health? How do people know what are the minimal nutritional levels that they must be? How do people know what behaviors are harmful and not to their health? How do people know uh, where they can, how they can finance their access to the health system? Health information systems. And this, I can tell you, health information and health communication is uh, in schools of public health, where I spent years of my life, uh, is the name of an entire department. When you're identifying what are the issues you're going to have in subdividing a school of public health in department, health information has to be one. Health financing has to be one. Uh, uh, health workforce uh, has to be one. Changing of the health system. So this is the WHO definition of a health system. Now, as I said, lots of information has been collected on how successful countries have been in achieving SDG 3.8. And so that indicator that I showed you earlier has, according to this analysis, the World Health Statistics, the latest publication of which is 2023, Monitoring Health for the SDGs, shows that during the first half of the SDGs, compared to pre-2015, it only rose uh, three index points. And then, since 2021, called it the part of the explanation, of course, there's been no significant progress in reducing financial hardship. In other words, the proportion of the population spending more than 10% of their household budget on health out of pocket has worsened since 2015 at an average of 0.2% points per year to reach 13.5%, uh, about a billion people, therefore lack the resources globally. So there you are, but this is to make you aware that to be able to follow health systems realizing the SDGs relating to health, we do have a statistical source of information. Now, do I have any questions so far? What I've tried to share with you is that the idea of healthcare for all was part of the founding of the World Health Organization in its definition of health. 
expanded to you to um, healthcare for all, focusing on primary health care in the Alma Ata Declaration. Embraced in the uh, concept of universal health coverage, which is adopted by all countries in the world, and then integrated into sustainable development goals and the tools for sustainable development goals. To translate that into practice, governments are encouraged to adapt their health systems to meet those needs. So we've seen what health systems are, why they're relevant to universal health coverage, and now uh, I will try to address the rather complex issue, and I'm going to try to simplify it, of what does the health system look like? We saw the six components. These are the six components. But how do you get them? What do you do? How do you structure the health system? Who pays? How does this happen? And basically, it's much more complicated than this. If you wanted to get sophisticated, you could find 20 different models. But they're basically four models. And some of them bear the names of old white men. That's not necessarily something that is going to inspire us. Uh, we don't always need old white men. I'll be leaving in a little while, and then you can get back to designing your own future. But people often refer, and you can show off your advanced knowledge by referring to the beverage model William Beveridge in the UK in 1948 established the system of sole payer. The state is the only one. That's where the health system is, is financed, and healthcare providers uh, um, work through that standardized system in the government. Another model in Europe started under uh, Otto von Bismarck, who was the chancellor of Prussia. Uh, Instead of having the state provided as the single payer, it was uh, part of the unification of Germany to establish compulsory insurance. Everybody who has a job contributes to insurance. The funds are there. With those funds, you finance the health system. Um, the national health insurance policy, it's a government-run insurance model, and we'll see countries that have applied that, where the government provides all the resources, furnishes the doctors, furnishes the medicines, and so on. And then you have the private insurance and out-of-pocket model, where uh, private parties have to pay for their own either insurance or pay directly for the health costs. Now, the Indian health system is usually considered to belong in this category, but it has its own particular characteristics. Um, it builds upon the Bohr report of 1947, I think, that uh, outlined at the beginning the emergence of the state of India, a, a health system that was supposed to make health care widely available. And now the features of the health care system are that under the union government, Ministry of Health and Family Welfare, you have the National Health Mission, uh, Ayushman Bharat, which was created in 2018, and explicitly created to achieve, using the term, universal health coverage. That's where the government has absorbed this international commitment to UHC, National Mental Health Program, and then multiple other systems at the state and local levels of primary health centers, community health centers, sub-centers, and government hospitals. But the interesting thing about Ayush Bharat is that it is supposedly serving 50 crore people. And if that's the case, if that information is accurate, that means that it is the world's largest government-sponsored healthcare system. And it was created, it's in the language that created this program, that it is seeking to achieve universal health coverage, taking the direct language from the UHC uh, resolution of the General Assembly of the United Nations and Sustainable Development Goal 3.8. However, that all looks good. You've got all these structures here. You've got uh, the, if you go back to, oh, no, 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 I don't want to do that.
So what you want to go back to is when you look at those structures of what the Indian healthcare system looks like or what other healthcare systems look like, you still want to come back to, okay, is the leadership and governance adequate to meet the needs? Service delivery, does that work? Is it properly financed? The workforce properly trained and deployed? Medical products available? And do people get access to adequate information so they know how to attend to their health care needs? In the Indian case, that seems to have been the government's objectives, but the reality that you face and that the Indian population face includes numerous social and financial inequalities that result in barriers to access to health care. In many places, and you've probably observed this, especially in rural areas, low quality care. You've observed, I've observed, in many clinics, overcrowding. You go to the clinics, people are all bunched up together and moving and pushing around and so on. Overcrowded clinics. There are reports of corruption where people get paid off because they want to uh, have certain advantages and get specialized treatment or have their products uh, favored over other products to be purchased by the healthcare system. Corruption has been accused. Um, since the system involves not just the public system but also the private system so that people can have access to private health care if they can't get it from the public sphere or if they want to have a higher level of care, these co-functioning public and private systems often have poor cooperation so that you get a wrong diagnosis here following up over there in the public sphere by something different and it's, they don't cooperate. The result is, according to the data of the World Health Organization, about 12% of uh, this is one indicator of health. Now, we know that health is complete physical, mental, and social well-being. Sometimes we look for a quick statistic to rank countries. So that's a caveat. You cannot judge a health system on one criteria. However, frequently used, a frequent sign of whether a health system is working is maternal mortality and infant mortality. Okay, so if the children can't live to the age of five and if mothers don't get adequate care during pregnancy and child delivery, and you have a high rate of maternal mortality and infant mortality, that's usually a sign that the healthcare system is not doing well. It's not everything, that's one indicator. I showed you the book of statistics, of health statistics. Use that to get the full range. But if we take this one indicator, and this is often used, about 12% of all maternal deaths and 18% of all infant mortality in the world is here in India, which makes it the highest in the world. No other country in the world has that level of uh, infant mortality. So that's a sign that perhaps some of these problems in the system are not allowing the system to achieve its full potential. So, to understand better the functioning of the Indian system, it is this mix of public and private. We saw the universal health coverage is supposed to be the, uh, the, the government model. It's supposed to reach 50 crore uh, people. But, in fact, uh, in the 80s, the options were some government-owned hospitals and private care facilities. However, in the last two decades, private insurance for those who can afford it but was available, and those who can afford it get access to private insurance and they get coverage. But the poor succumb to their illness or pay for health care by other means, and this uh, results in their relying on uh, access to health by using traditional medicine, uh, by benefiting from the CSR payments that corporations make, they can fund health products, charity, and philanthropy. So the result is that this covers some of the poor, 
but people who are not covered by health insurance or by state systems, by the government systems, uh, pay for their medical services out of pocket, and that's been estimated at 75% of the population. I'm going to skip that. Now, so that's essentially the Indian system, but uh, let me give you some more details on how the other systems work, and then I'm going to show you an example. If you think the Indian system has its weaknesses, and I have the list of problems that it has, I'm going to show you another healthcare system that has some really significant weaknesses. So the beverage model, single payer system, provides for healthcare free. You just show up and you get the healthcare that you need. NHS is in the UK is uh, a model for this when it's functioning properly. And so the government decides, it's not the medical profession, it's the government that determines what the doctor can do and what the hospital can charge. And it has its problems. There are administrative shortfalls, there are waiting lists, there's many other things that, um, that make the single payer system uh, difficult to implement. But for those who need access, and I'm going to show you a film about that in a second, uh, it has its advantages. Here's, let's see if this works. This guy broke his ankle. Uh, how much would this cost him? Some huge bill. He's in an NHS hospital. Here, NHS everything is free. I'm asking about hospital charges. You're laughing. Even with insurance, there's a bound to get bill something. What they charge for that baby? This is NHS. It's not, it's not America. <laughs> so uh, this is where people come to pay their bill when they're done staying in the hospital. No, this is the NHS hospital. So you don't pay the bill. Why does it say cashier here if people don't have to pay a bill? Because you know, reduced means get the traffic expenses reimbursed. So in British hospitals, instead of money going into the cashier's window. Okay. Do, does anybody recognize who was the man in that the red cap and the yeah the red cap the red cap didn't say MAGA. You don't know who that is. But. All right. This is a filmmaker. You just noticed it. Um, so that's a filmmaker who's um, made who made a film called Sicko in which he showed the problems of the healthcare system, especially in the United States. And I'm going to show you another extract from that film. But in this part, he's showing how NHS works. And when you come from the private system that predominates in the US, and you come to an NHS hospital in the UK, you can have surprises like that. Here's this couple from Africa with their baby. And he says, well, how much do they charge? No, 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 no. You're not American. This is the NHS. Nothing. And he goes to the cashier's window. And he says, OK, this is where you pay. No, this is where they give you money for a taxi to go home. So the point there is that that type of single payer system, when it's functioning properly, has these advantages that anyone, anytime, gets proper health care at no cost. It's covered by the state. The Bismarck model, in many other countries in Europe, has employees pay into an insurance fund deducted from their salaries and then the government uses that money to cover the costs of the health care treatment. And they control, uh, they control the use of the funds to make sure that the hospitals don't overcharge, because obviously they're using the insurance plan that everybody is required to pay into. So it works somewhat similar to the single payer system, but it goes through a process of a payroll deduction, taxes go to the government, the, the government then 
pays for all the health care costs. Other countries have a national health insurance model. And here, the government pays, excuse me, citizens pay into a government-sponsored insurance program. But it's in the private sector. So the government takes your money and pays the private sector. Since the government is paying the private sector, the government can say, here's the maximum you can charge for this medication. It's not, you're not going to squeeze that money out of the patient. We're the government. We're paying you. Don't charge too much. So it drives down the cost through negotiations. And, but in this case, for that to function, and this has been observed quite a bit in Canada, there may be longer waits because the healthcare system does not have enough. We saw among the list of six components of a health system, health workforce, health workforce is, uh, is not enough, and the healthcare facilities are not enough. And then the situation that we have in the outer pocket that we already looked at, individuals are responsible for paying for all medical expenses out of pocket. And in this case, in the case of India and the United States, comparing the two, the socioeconomically disadvantaged results in unequal access to health care. But the government then supplements the health access that the private sector is providing, especially for those who can afford it. For those who cannot afford it, the government has programs like um, uh, Ayushman Bharat, uh, if it's functioning adequately to reach all people who need health care in India. And in the United States, there are three entirely publicly funded programs that uh, meet the health needs of a limited portion of the population of the United States. Medicare, Medicaid, and the Veterans Health Administration. So one caters to older people, one caters to poor people, and the third one caters to military veterans. So that's where some of the people. Now, this is an opportunity for you to see the reaction of people who are used to the Bismarck model and the single payer system model when they learn for the first time how the US system works. If healthcare is a constitutional right, then that's a form of communism because no country could afford those payments without seizing the assets of everybody else. Welcome to Finland. Oh. Dudes, what's going on? Lose your health insurance. When you lose your job, that's when 
society should help you? I've chosen a creative job and had the backing of a healthcare system. But if you don't have that, do you pick the safe job or do you pick the creative job? The average price per unit for insulin in 2018. Germany, $11. Canada's $12. US, how much? Wow. It's like eight times the price of uh, insulin in Canada. I guess that explains why Americans come up to Canada to buy medication. <laughs> the, uh, sorry, I'm sorry, hold on. So the FDA doesn't have any authority over the prices? They have also privatized health insurance companies in Germany, but the prices uh, are regulated by the government. The government negotiates the prices and fixes that price for two years. They say, well, they regulate this stuff to keep the prices down and, you know, avoid like this happening. Right, so I'm looking at an American medical bill. Why is it so expensive? $428,000 Skin to skin after C-section is $39. I had to pay $39.35 to hold my baby after he was born. You need to pay money to hold a baby? <laughs> My brother Jamie, who's in a lot of our videos, was pretty badly injured. He's going to lose a couple fingers. Uh, if you can give a dollar, or if you can give five dollars, every little bit will help him and his family. That's heartbreaking. I, I... Go fund me. You know what that is, right? GoFundMe should not be something that people have to resort to to pay for their medical bills. So in America, people spend more than twice as much as in Japan for healthcare. You know, if I, I just, did, I asked if anybody understood GoFundMe. You don't have that here. Yeah. Right, but do, do the students know this? Because I'm not getting. Okay, you know this. Then you should have nodded or said something. I only stopped it because I was afraid, oh, you don't know what they're talking about. So yes, guy cuts his finger off to take care of him. The brother has to launch on, online a GoFundMe thing to get enough money to pay for him to have a, a finger attached. That's a healthcare system? Does that meet the six criteria of the health system we were talking about? And this is an important number here. The cost per capita. So it's now $11,072 per person is the amount spent every year. We're going to come to what that is in India in a minute. These are among developing developed countries. Pay twice the amount for a car. I would want the car to be twice as good. So what's, what's the life expectancy in the U.S.? Why is it less? The U.S. should be on top of both of those lists. Like, if you're charging your citizens that much money, then they better be living the longest lives. It, it, it doesn't make sense. When Alec turned 26, he was no longer allowed on his mother's insurance plan. Instead, he decided to pay for his insulin over the counter at list price. But the pharmacist told him a month's supply would be $1,300. He left empty handed. $1,300 a month. I developed a heart condition and I had to have my heart restarted three times. Uh, after the third time I had it restarted, the doctor suggested I get heart surgery. When I was 13, I started to get sick and really, really sick. I was then very quickly admitted into hospital where after three weeks I had treatment for a brain virus. The cost of the operation I think is about $60,000. Uh, and then uh, the next day when I left the hospital and I got my bill, it was a bill for parking. I was treated by royal doctors, had several MRIs and other punctures, all for free. So I, I was pretty happy that I, uh, I lived in Canada and had universal health care. I couldn't have survived if I was in America. To know that I can get sick, I can get injured, but I will still be taken care of. That is freedom. This is not freedom. 
Okay, what did you think of that? I mean, it was fun to watch, but I think there's some, some takeaways, right? You can see that people who are used to a system that does the obvious, that allows you to cover the basic cost of things. I mean, look at the, I've seen hospital bills like that. And, but it took this film to show me that there actually is a daily charge if you hold your baby. Can you imagine that? Plus the room charges in the hospital, with the, the hundreds of thousands of dollars and so on. So I'm just wondering if, yeah, so we showed that the cost per capita of healthcare in the US was over $10,000. But now when we consider the financing side of the six elements of a health system, in India, it's less than $100. And total healthcare spending in the US, total healthcare spending, and notice is ruining people. These people uh, commit suicide, or they die because they can't get treatment. They lose their job and they lose their health insurance and they can't get health care. Nevertheless, four trillion dollars is spent on health care in the United States compared to uh, 130 to 150 billion dollars in India. So this comparison is meaningful because unlike all the other countries you saw, Finland and Canada and, and uh, UK and so on, a complex mix of public and private health care and insurance characterizes both India and the United States. Each one has some well-functioning public services that provide health care for those who need it, a portion of the population. Uh, I gave you the examples of Medicaid and Medicare in the United States. Only a small fraction of the population are touched by that. And uh, in India, there are still people who are not covered. Um, this is an interesting, uh, oh, you can't, it doesn't show up very well on the chart. So imagine for each of these countries, uh, New Zealand, Portugal, Finland, UK, Denmark, the chart is coming up here, you can't see it very well, is coming up here, that as per capita health expenditure increases in all of those countries, life expectancy increases. So they go up, if you see Spain and Italy and Switzerland and Japan, they're up there in the mid 80s as the life expectancy of a person. In the US, with the expenditures, and here are these expenditures in these other countries, take Japan, it's right here at $5,000 per person, right in the middle. Highest life expectancy. US, $10,000. And it's way down to 78 as the uh, average life expectancy. And you saw that other chart where the person said, how is this possible? You spend more money, you should live longer. That's what health is all about. Guess what? Failure of the health system. Now, um, perhaps we were going to do a, a little uh, experiment, um, not experiment, a little involvement of the students. Is anybody who's briefed you on the exercise that you're going to do, grouping in groups of 10 and, and reporting out, do we have anybody to help guide us on here? And I could try to pull it together, but I prefer somebody who works with this. What I'd like to do is to have you sit in groups of 10, and try it, and answer a question which I'm going to put up on the screen, and then report back out. Let's try it. Can we do it? Can you help me group? Let's group a... Uh, we can take this group here, and then, so, all right. So the two, I'm going to give you the question, and you're going to turn your chairs around and say, well, I think, I think, and then designate somebody to report out, because you're going to answer a question and say, this is our answer, a collective answer. <coughs> and the second group, I think we can maybe we should divide it here. And you can group, and then the third group,
Oh, yes, and then yes. the central group, how many can you get from them? Yes, 11. All of them? Okay. And then this group here, is that all back? Okay. Okay. And students are there. So we constitute another group. So what have we got? About five groups? So. So we're going to take five minutes for you to meet in your groups and answer this question. OK, you've got two questions here. I'm going to ask you to answer the first question. So the first question is, what would be the preferred or ideal model of health system that you'd want to apply in your country? You saw those models. You saw that India and the US have this mixed model and public-private. You saw all these other models. How would you structure the health system that you would find the most satisfactory? So can I ask you to start talking? Get together in a group. Find a person to be the leader or to speak for you. Answer the question. Each of the groups. You folks. You folks. Remember, you're only answering question one. Only answering question one, and you're going to designate a person who's going to stand up and say, "Our group thinks that the preferred system is." Complete the question. Okay. Get back to talking. Talk, 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 talk. Talk, 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 talk. Decided? Who's going to be the person speaking for you? He's going to speak, and you agree? You're the spokesperson, and you all agree on what health system you want? Well, come to an agreement. Okay, folks, are you ready? If I ask your spokesperson to answer question one, you're ready? No, a little more time. Give you another couple of minutes. Go for it. Okay, 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 so um, I'm going to ask the spokesperson for each group to stand up and share your conclusions. I think that the ideal system for my country would be, etc. So, group one. Yes. Go to your microphone. So uh, we discussed and we have come to this conclusion that um, the beverage model can be a good, like it can be something that we can uh, have for India because uh, it is based on taxes. And as we all know that everybody, uh, in every sector there are taxes, everybody pays taxes and through that, the government will automatically fund the health healthcare uh, like uh, ha, it, it, our healthcare uh, it will be covered through taxes only so we have decided i mean we have discussed okay thank you very very much group 2 uh, sir we have uh, our team has decided that the national health insurance model will be the most appropriate uh, model that to be applied in a country because there's a huge gap between the poor and the rich. So to uh, 
close that bridge to uh, close that bridge so this model will be very benefit and there is no marketing strategies also it tends to be much cheaper and it strictly opposes the profit making system sir thank you Uh, sir, uh, our model is AP related to group two model. So uh, it's because of the difference between the, the gap between the rich and the poor. Uh, we've decided, our team, we've decided that we'll go for this model, universal health care coverage. Uh, providing access to affordable health care services for all citizens is crucial. Implementing a universal health care system can ensure that everyone, regardless of their finan financial status, can receive necessary medical care. As for our group, we uh, we think that the the be uh, beverage model would be suitable for us, as beverage model. The first one, because uh, because there are no out of pocket costs for the patient since taxed entirely uh, fund the uh, programs, so there is no financial stress uh, uh, from the patient side. We as well think that the beverage model would be the best as because uh, we think that we are not getting enough for what we are paying as taxes. Okay, because it comes from taxes. Yeah. Yes. Sir. Okay. And I guess the last group. Let me pass this mic to you. We have decided the national health insurance model as like um, USC and like they integrate both and uh, both public and private sectors, their research and innovation and health insurance schemes in India like uh, Ayushman Bharat scheme. That's it. Thank All right. <coughs> so. Anybody else? Oh, yes. Oh, my gosh. This group. <laughs> Uh, good afternoon, Professor, faculty members, and everyone present here. Uh, sir, I'm Sukanya Hazarika uh, from BA Sociology, sixth semester. So, on behalf of my team members, uh, I would like to conclude. We would like to conclude that uh, for this question, for the first question, we have chosen NHS, uh, that is National Health Service, uh, which will provide free health care for everyone. So there is a rationale behind it because India may be known for demographic dividend. That is like uh, there are uh, young, younger population in India. Even though we are young, there is a majority of population who is young, but we may have the potential of working. But there is an issue of unemployment, poverty, which is in a higher degree than other countries. And there is a higher degree of class inequality and power dynamics. So uh, NHS will be helpful because uh, despite uh, of having a huge disparity, it will at least provide some amount of free healthcare and welfare, health welfare for everyone. That's all. Thank you, sir. I can see some of you getting jobs in this sector. It'll be wonderful for India if you do. So, all right, so there's a, obviously an emerging consensus. Most of you tend to favor the single payer system and uh, the alt principal alternative uh, is um, the Bismarck model and uh, national health insurance schemes. The out the, this type of situation is what I can fully understand you want to avoid. And now, if you'd like, I can show the same filmmaker obviously is making fun of people who don't understand that a properly functioning health system means that you need health, you get the service. 
He shows the example of NHS in the UK where he makes fun of the fact that the cashier's office is a place where they give you money for a taxi rather than they take your money to pay for your health expenses. He also made a comparison between, this is for fun because I'm going to reward you now, he makes a comparison between the health care that's offered in Guantanamo Bay. Do you all know what Guantanamo Bay is? That's the location where the United States has placed suspects for complicity in the uh, attack on the United States in Manhattan, Lower Manhattan, in 2001, the 9-11 attack and the war that then was declared on Afghanistan <coughs> and in the Middle East and all the people who were rounded up could not be brought to the United States because they wanted to get information from them and torture is prohibited in the United States. So they took them to a base on the island of Cuba that the United States has complete control over on a 99 year lease. So the US runs this, US sovereignty is there, but it's not in a legal jurisdiction of the US. So they felt that they could do anything they wanted. And large amounts of uh, horrendous torture was committed there and people were kept there for 20 years with no trial, no release, a horrendous, one of the worst violations of human rights uh, of, this, of this century. But it's also true, and this is the contrast that he's pointing out, that Guantanamo offered health care, or claims to have offered health care, to the people who were incarcerated there, and the filmmaker, Michael Moore, discovered that those people who risked their lives to save people in 9-11 when the Twin Towers were attacked and crashed down and people died and there was lots of uh, uh, 3,000 people died. You all remember that major incident, 9-11, which led to um, a transformation in international relations. So he discovered that um, the people who risked their lives, the firefighters and healthcare providers who went to the building, saved people's lives, have health consequences, respiratory illnesses, and other illnesses that resulted from their effort to save people from the attack in 9-11. And many of those people found that they could not get proper health care for the reasons you saw in that other film that showed how hard it is to get adequate health care in the United States, the place where they charge you to hold your baby against your skin and that sort of thing. Okay, you saw, you remember all that, and that's why it's difficult for those people. So to drive this point home, he took 9-11 responders who could not get health care in the United States and said, I'm going to take them to Cuba. Detainees representing a threat to our national security are given access to top-notch medical facilities. They have acute care 24 hours uh, a day in which uh, surgical procedures, everything can be performed right there in the detainee uh, camps. This is the dental clinic or the health clinic slash dental clinic? We have a physical therapy department x-ray capabilities with digital x-rays. We have one single operating room, health personnel to detainee ratio. <coughs> These are for the people who have been picked up by U.S. military and brought to Guantanamo. Screening for cancer is taking place there. Colonoscopy is a procedure which is performed there on a, on a routine basis. Actually, one place on American soil that had free universal health care that 
That's all I needed to know. We commandeered a fishing boat and sailed into Guantanamo Bay. As we approached the line of the water between the American and Cuban side of the bay, we were told to be careful for mines. Responder. Permission to enter. I have three 9-11 rescue workers. They need some medical attention. Al-Qaeda, you know what that is? They don't want more than you're giving to evildoers. Just the same. Hello? <laughs> now. Okay, so technical difficulty, I'm not going to be able to show you the rest of the movie. Let me tell you what it shows. So you saw that he is drawing attention to the outrageous contradiction that the people who risk their lives and have health consequences to rescue people after 9-11 cannot get health care in the United States, but the United States is telling Congress, telling the Parliament, that don't worry, we're taking good care of these people, they have good health care. So he says, okay, I'm going to take the responders there. And then, of course, he doesn't get into Guantanamo. But what he does do is then take them to Havana, Cuba. And as you know, the United States and Cuba have been enemies since the creation of the communist state of Cuba, and the United States imposes sanctions on Cuba, makes life difficult for Cuba, because Cuba is a communist government. Well, he brings these 9-11 responders to Havana and takes them to a hospital. They're immediately taken into the hospital. They are treated, there's some extraordinary scenes in that, if I could get this to work. There's some extraordinary scenes in there where um, they discover that they need a certain medicine and this woman responder has been taking that medicine for years paying like uh, $200 a week and they sell her the medicine for something like 12 cents a, a packet and so on. Plus they get care unlike anything they ever received in the United States. So he's showing two things here. Is that the hypocrisy of the United States that cannot provide health care for the responders in the U.S. advertises that they give good health care in Guantanamo. Of course, they won't let the responders go there. So then he goes to the enemy, communist state, where they get immediate and quality health care. Now, I have to immediately say that anybody, reasonable person watching that would say, okay, this is a filmmaker. He's trying to make a point. Obviously, they set that up, and, they, and obviously the Cuban government is going to help them because they'll want to get the message across. Apparently, no. Apparently, there have been journalists who have interviewed people and found that these visits, and, and the scene that you can't see there because I can't get this to work, shows the responders in tears at the end, hugging the doctors and nurses in the Cuban hospital. And some people have... Um, underscored the authenticity of that. So that's an interesting little reward for your sharing your thoughts on what would be the best healthcare system. Clearly, the contradictions of the US healthcare system. Oh, now it's working. All right, I'll show you the tears. You want to see? 
The people, I'll show you the end, because we don't have much time. I'm going to go right to the end. <laughs> okay. So, I'm not here to denounce the weaknesses of the U.S. system. I'm here to give you a sense of the range of options that are available, and you examine the, that range of options and reached in your six groups conclusions that tended to favor ones that provide for centralized funding that provides genuine health care for all, so all people who come, whether it's paid by a state-sponsored insurance or paid for 100% by the government, that tends to be what, what you favor. And India has elements of that. It also has the weaknesses that we saw. And in the case of the US, these are the, the weaknesses of the US system. But again, my purpose is not to denounce the US system. There's high quality health care in the United States, but there are millions of people who do not have access to health care. The Affordable Health Care Act, adopted during the administration of Barack Obama, uh, did provide access to health care for tens of millions of people, but it has not solved the problem. Um, <clears throat> there were 45 million uninsured before the Affordable Care Act and 27 million after. And then it increased and it's going up and down. So it made a big difference. This is beginning to close the gap between those who have access to health care and those who do not. But the problems that you saw in that other movie of the health care expenses continue and that is a major issue of a health care system. So as we try to understand comparative health care systems and what it can mean for your work as social workers and as sociologists to understand the place that that has in people's lives. Try to keep in mind the overall objective dating back to 1946 and uh, 1978 uh, when health was defined broadly in the World Health Organization, the Almada Declaration committed governments to universal primary health care globally, transformed into universal health coverage, transformed into a major sustainable development goal that countries are trying to realize and statistics are being main maintained for how close they're getting to it. Countries are falling short and the US and India have in common that they're struggling with the balancing of the private and public system and making health care available to the poor. Both have significant failures in that regard. Um, these statistics show that half of adults find it difficult to afford health care costs, and of course this increases for minorities. Um, I'm going to skip this and go to one final thing. Um, when the health care is provided by a private insurance, uh, private insurance that is paid for either because of your employer who deducts from your salary and pays into the insurance company, or because you pay it directly to the insurance company, you have private insurance. But the decision on what is covered or not depends not on a doctor saying, I have a Hippocratic oath as a doctor. I am committed in everything I do in my profession to do no harm and to provide the care that's needed for a person. I cannot falter in that duty. If you are working for an insurance company, even if you're a doctor and you have to help the insurance company make a decision, here's what happens. Dr. Linda Pino, former medical reviewer at Humana. So, Can you hear that?
been watching this over and over again for a decade now. And that testimony that she gave before Congress, explaining that as a doctor, this was her job, to, d to stamp denied on papers that come in so that the insurance company saves a half a million dollars and the patient dies because the patient can't get the resources elsewhere. And the moral reality of that came crushing home. And at the end, when she chokes up in tears, you can understand why. This is, again, I'm not trying to denounce the system. I'm trying to say in the most extreme depictions of the weaknesses of the system, that is unacceptable. It's against medical ethics. It's against any commitment to health. It's against anything that any social worker would ever agree with. So um, I, these are some more facts about the consequences of the high cost of health care in the United States. But my point, again, is to show you that um, over the last century, models of health care have been worked with. And it is true, as you found out in your groups in talking about it, that the models that tend to genuinely take seriously that everyone has access to health care and that it should be through either a required insurance so that everybody pays into the insurance and there's enough to cover the health costs, or that is paid from taxes by, as, an, as a function of the state, seems to be, as far as I can tell, the only way to have any chance of achieving that goal of universal health coverage. But the interesting thing for us, as we reflect on the understanding of the concept of the highest attainable standard of health as a fundamental human right for all. Those are the exact words of the Constitution of the World Health Organization and of human rights treaties adopted by the United Nations. If we take health as a human right, then you have no choice. You cannot have a system that, if functioning properly, is going to result in the types of abuses that we saw. So you have a range of options, mixes that are involved in there. The healthcare system is a place where you can achieve a lot, an enormous amount, but it has to be moving in the direction of UHC, if you believe in UHC. And it, you don't have to be uh, a communist in Cuba providing health care for all. Obviously not. It can be done in a capitalist economy. It works. It has worked in the UK, but the UK is failing. Uh, the uh, the uh, national health system in the UK is having enormous difficulties now. So the challenge, therefore, is not just to do what you did in your groups and say, I choose single payer system. It's to make it work in practice by implementing the six component elements of a healthcare system in a meaningful way. And that means allocating sufficient resources through the national budget. And the big complaint, of course, about India is, in spite of the very promising government programs that have been established that reach 50 crore people, that nevertheless, India's expenditure on health is about 1.6% when most people assessing what the needs are in India think that the minimum should be of expenditure of the national budget for health should go up to 2.5%. These are the challenges that lie ahead. Whether this is something that the BJP is going to succeed in achieving or the BJT will fail and you need another party to do it. That's the political issue that you're, that you're going to decide. But the functioning of a health system is a fundamental component of a functioning society. And I think that those of you in sociology and in uh, social work have an incredibly important role to play in understanding the importance of health systems 
what can be accomplished and what challenges will face you in your professional careers. Thank you very much for the opportunity of letting me interact with you today.